richly bless you. David said, this is the day that the Lord has made. Then he made a conscious decision. He said, I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. I'm really thankful that I'm part of a wonderful family. That is the family of God and God's family is found all over the earth. Amen. Well, it seems like David and Nola, they have made their way back to Washington State from Arizona. God richly bless you. Amen. And once again, I would like to just say hello to Pastor John Doc and his wife Myrna. I have made two trips to the Philippines, and they are the people that I worked with and I traveled with. So God richly bless you in Jesus Wonderful, wonderful name. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place because we're going to meet the other members of the family of God that we have not met here. So I'm home. It's good to be home. It's good to be with my family. It's good to be with Valerie. The lifesaver was that uh, my son-in-law, Mike, who was in Mexico with Pastor Tom at that orphanage, uh, we have a an Apple iPad, and uh, Mike had an Apple iPad, and so we were able to use, uh, no, Face, FaceTime. And uh, it was really good. The problem was, I was trying to, I was, I lived in one day, and she lived in a, in a former day, because when it's, when it's, when it's Sunday here, it's Monday there, and and there's 14 hours difference, so you've got to make sure that, uh, that you call it a, the right hour. I remember when I went to Chile a number of years ago, in my head, now you've got to get a map, but in my head I thought, I live in Seattle, West Coast, Pacific Ocean. Uh, now I'm in Chile, West Coast of South America, Pacific Ocean. So I thought, I'll call my wife. So I called her what I thought was 10 a.m. in the morning. And when I got her, she sounded a little groggy because it was 5 a.m. in the morning in Seattle. And then I discovered that although it's that uh, Chile is on the, the west coast and on the Pacific coast, yet it is further east than Florida. You know, so the time changes. So uh, got to get these time changes right. Amen. But I... I had the wonderful privilege, and I count it a privilege and a, a real honor to take a, another missions trip. Uh, I, I stepped down from being pastor in June 2010, and since then I've had the wonderful honor of ministering in 15 different countries. And I just say, to God be the glory, and I'm just thankful for that. And this time I made a trip to, to India and also to Thailand. I left on, now remember, there's only 28 days in February. I left on February the 25th, and I returned home on March the 26th. So I was gone a total of 30 days. Now, uh, sometimes those days can get long because it's very easy to be lonely. And uh, that's why I was really thankful for FaceTime. I could uh, talk to Val and Amy and Mike and the kids. But I want to say a couple of things about India, and then I'm going to get to my message. And, but uh, the primary religion in India is Hinduism. 85% of the population of India is Hindu. Now keep in mind that India has a population of 1.3 billion people. Now that is a lot of people. The streets are full of people, full of bicycles, full of motorcycles, little tiny ones, full of, full of automobiles, just people everywhere. But 85% of them are Hindu. Then 8% of that population is Muslim. 2% of India's population is Sikh. 
and you identify them because they were the turbans. Two and a half percent of India's population is Buddhist, and then two and a half percent, they say, is Christian. Now, the first city I arrived in was called Chennai, and by the way, altogether, I took nine airplane flights, so that's a, that, that's a lot of flying, and that's a lot of in, in, in one airport, I spent 12 hours. In the other airport, I spent nine hours. So that's a lot of flying around and a lot of waiting. But I arrived in Chennai, which was formerly known as Madras. And in that city, I was there for a total of six days. And I preached six times in those six days. And the highlight was the Sunday morning I was there when I gave an invitation for people to come forward to receive Christ, and I had the opportunity to pray for five young adults, the sinner's prayer, and introduce them to Jesus. What this world needs is Jesus. We have a, 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 a one-word message, and it's all about Jesus. He's the Savior, and He's the Healer, and He's the Baptizer in the Holy Ghost, and He's the coming King. And so this morning, whatever you need, Jesus is. And so uh, had a wonderful, wonderful time there. Now, the culture of India, now I, I think I'll get to my message, but the culture of India is totally different than the culture here in the United States. I know some people complain about the pews. They're not soft enough. Well, I want you to know in India, they don't sit on chairs. And they don't sit on pews. And they don't sit on pillows. They sit either on dirt floors or they sit on cement floors. And they just sit there. And I just think, wow. I mean, I could get down. That's not the problem, Brother Patrick. It's getting back up again that is the problem. Uh, something else about India, when you, when you go to church, you leave your shoes outside. Because they think that the church is the holy ground. And God said to Moses, Moses, you are standing on holy ground. And because it's holy ground, and what made it holy? It wasn't the bush that made it holy. It was the God in the bush that made it holy. And so Jesus is here. Jesus is here. He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So he's here today. And the reason he's here, he came because you came. See, we've gathered in a sheep shed. We're sheep. And this morning we've gathered in a sheep shed. And the purpose of a sheep shed is twofold. Number one, the sheep shed keeps us dry in the winter. Aren't you glad for that? And number two, it keeps us cool in the summer. So they sit on, and so they take their shoes off, and then the women sit on one side, and the men sit on the other side. Now, they have another custom, and I think it's a pretty good custom. I think it's a pretty good custom because they don't have the problems that we have. But they have arranged marriages. They have arranged marriages. I'm part of an arranged marriage. Now, now her parents didn't arrange the marriage, but I'm part of an arranged marriage. Because the greatest marriage is yet to take place. Do you know that? So I hope I'm going in the right direction. I didn't plan to do this or say this. But you know, uh, no matter what marriage you have attended, the greatest marriage has yet to take place. That's when Jesus, huh, the heavenly bridegroom, is going to come and receive his bride, which is the church, unto himself. And folks, that's an arranged marriage. That's an arranged marriage. Now, I don't know how this all fits in my theology. But Jesus said, you have not chosen me. But I've chosen you, John 15, 16. And the Bible says this. And I don't know how this fits. And you theologians can figure it all out. Because they've been fighting over this for years. 
But here it is. I just, listen, folks, we should speak when the Bible speaks, and we should be silent when the Bible is silent. And here's the verse, and you can interpret it any way you want to. But Ephesians chapter 1, I think it's verse 3 or 4, somewhere in there. It says, according as God has chosen us in him. Do you know that Abraham had a son called Isaac? And he wanted to get a bride, or he wanted to get a wife for Isaac. And so he had a servant called Eliezer. And he gave Eliezer a job to do. He says, you know, I want you to go, and I want you to find a bride, a beautiful bride for my son Isaac. And Eliezer went, and he found Rebekah. And guess what? It really was love at first sight. Well, you know, Abraham is a type of God, the Heavenly Father. And Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and Isaac is a type of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day the Father said to the Holy Ghost, I want you to go down into the world and I want you to find a bride for my son, Jesus. And one of these days, the greatest wedding is going to take place. And I tell you something, we're yet to see the greatest feast. And that's called the marriage feast of the Lamb. Folks, there's a table that's been spread where the saints of God are fed. And he invites the chosen people come and dine. And one of these days, the trumpet's going to sound. The heavens are going to open. Jesus is going to descend. And the church of the living God is going to arise to meet the bridegroom in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Lots of things. I don't care whether you're pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation. There's lots of things about the second coming I don't know. I, uh, this isn't in the notes. I hope I'm, God, I hope it's you. If it's not you, I'm in trouble. There's three things I know for sure about the second coming. Number one, it's going to happen. I said it's going to happen. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I shall come again. I shall return, and our Lord never, ever, ever goes back on his word. Number two, I know this, it's going to be a surprise. Sure is. Because the Bible says when Jesus comes, he's going to come as a thief in the night. That means he's going to come unannounced. He's going to come unexpectedly. He's going to come as a thief. I mean, if I were to say, Patrick, you don't know me, my profession, I'm a thief. And I've chosen your condominium. And tonight at midnight, Patrick, guess what? When you're fast asleep, I'm going to crawl in your kitchen window. And I'm going to come at midnight, and I'm going to enter your house, and I'm going to take all those precious things that you have. Well, if I phoned him up and said that to him, guess what? Midnight tonight would come, and there by the kitchen window would be Patrick standing with a big baseball bat. Huh? And as soon as I climbed through that window, whammo, he'd hit me on the side of my head. No, Jesus is coming, and guess what? I've had my house broken into. And when a thief comes, he doesn't take everything in your house. He only comes for precious things. And when he gets what he came for, those precious things, then what does he do? He leaves. Generally speaking, a thief leaves more behind than what he takes. Well, one of these days, Jesus, as a thief in the night, is going to come, and he's after those precious jewels. He's after those precious pearls. Do you know what you are? You are the peril of great price. And Jesus is coming after his treasures. Hallelujah. And guess what? When Jesus comes as a thief for the pearl, for his church, for his bride, as soon as he gets what he came for, he's going to leave. And when he leaves, he's going to leave more behind than what he took. 
brother, sister, there's going to be a meeting in the air. In that sweet, sweet by and by. I'm going to meet you, meet you over there in that home beyond the sky. Just music you will hear, never heard by mortal ear. It will be glorious, I do declare, for God's own Son will be the leading one in the meeting in the earth. Oh, hallelujah! Hallelujah! Jesus! And the third thing I know about the second coming of Jesus is going to be personal. He is not going to come as represented by another. There will be no stand-ins, no substitutes. When Jesus comes for his beautiful bride, and I say it's beautiful. And I say it's beautiful because he beautified us. He gave us beautiful ashes. The oil of joy for mourning and a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. And he's going to come. He's going to come himself. Songwriter said, what a day, Mark goes. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saves me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through that promised land, what a day, glorious day, brother Ben, that's going to be, hallelujah! Jesus. Jesus. I'm going to get back to my report, but here's another verse. Another verse. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, our citizenship is in heaven. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I don't feel at home in this world anymore. Our citizenship is in heaven. I know every one of you under the sign of my voice. You are proud of your citizenship. But I want you to know, Valerie Ann Harris, there's a greater citizenship than Canadian citizenship. And it's not American. Pastor Jan Duck, there's a greater citizenship than Filipino citizenship. And Tamara, I want you to know there's a greater citizenship than U.S. citizenship. You say, what citizenship is that? Heavenly citizenship. Heavenly. I got dual citizenship. I'm a citizen of the United States, but I'm a citizen of that heavenly country called heaven. And there's only one way you can get that heavenly citizenship. Most people in this country become citizens by birth. That's the only way you can become a citizen of heaven. You become a citizen of heaven by birth. Jesus said, we must be born again. So... Our citizenship is in heaven. And I like this next part of the verse. From whence also we look for the Savior. I like that. We look for the Savior. Folks, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. You can look for him all you want to. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I am looking for Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the Bible am I told to look for the Antichrist. But i got to keep my eyes open because one of these days the heavens are going to open and Jesus, my heavenly bridegroom, is going to descend and receive us unto himself. So I'm, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. I'm 
I'm not looking for a hole in the ground. I'm looking for a hole in the sky. Hallelujah. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which shall alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. working. I don't need it. Okay. It died.
Thank you. From Chennai, I went to a place called Tamale. I've been to many poor places, Brother Jamdok, in the Philippines. But I have never been to a place like Tanali and the surrounding villages. Folks, we have much to be thankful for. We have a roof over our head. We have clothes on our back. We have shoes on our feet. And we have wonderful food in our bellies. And we have a nice mattress to sleep on. So we are a blessed people. So I say to Americans everywhere, stop complaining about the things you don't have and start giving thanks to God for what you do have. They were the poorest of the poor. I was there for 13 days. I preached 16 times. I went to an orphanage. An orphanage of 100 children. That's a lot of kids. Because I was raised in an orphanage, I gave them my testimony. I could relate. A number of those kids came forward and gave their hearts to Jesus. You know, I was there when they fed those children. Give them a tin plate, a pile of rice, no meat, no chicken, and there was some type of a, a curry sauce because they really love hot curry. You want to know why I got no hair? I blew my hair off eating that curry. <laughs> curry in the morning, curry in the evening, curry at supper time. And I mean it's hot. It's hot. But I would see those kids, they would come in very orderly. I tell you, the behavior of those kids, just beautiful. And the girls would sit in one section, and the boys in another. And they lift up their voice and they give thanks to God for their meal. I don't know where you're going for lunch. I don't know what you're going to have for lunch. But I tell you, when you bow your head, and say, thank you, Jesus, for this food, because he has blessed you. Well, like I said, I preached 16 times in 13 days. I went to three places where they didn't have a church building. They would climb steps, and they would have church on top of a flat roof of a building. They would just sing and praise the Lord. I went to one church that had no church building. So in the street, they marked out a place every every Sunday and every Friday to come to the same place. We just get down in the street, sit with our legs crossed, and we just preach the gospel. And people are just passing by, but you're just preaching Jesus. And so... In that Tanelli area, I was there for 13 days. I, I preached 16 times in 13 days. And I had the privilege of praying for 104 people in Tanelli to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. I just want to I got off track when I talked about arranged marriages. Pastor Titus, he got married in 2012. He met his wife in November 2011. 
He met his wife for the first time. His parents came in, and the bride's parents, her name was Dasheba. And there was this man and this woman had never seen one another. But both sets of parents came to an agreement that each thought that their son or daughter would be a match for each other. And after a lot of discussion went on, then the bride's parents got up and walked out of the room, and the groom's parents got up and walked out of the room, and that young man and that young lady were there, and they talked to one another for 15 minutes. And after that 15-minute conversation, a few months later, no dating, then they were married. Pastor Parman, who I stayed with in Tonelli, same happened to him. And, uh, but know what that tells me? Those parents are invested in that marriage. Really invested in that marriage. I'm going to close because I can't get to my sermon. But uh, I went to Thailand. There's such a deep contrast between Thailand and India. Now, in India, you would see two young men walking down the street hand in hand. Or you would see two young ladies walking down the street hand in hand. And culturally, that is acceptable. But this is what you will not find. You will never find an outward display publicly of affection between a man and a woman. You will never see a man or a woman walking arm in arm. You will never see a man or a woman walking hand in hand. There is no outward display publicly of affection between the opposite sex. But in Tanali, uh, in Thailand, uh, Thailand has got a population. It's a very small country, not very far from Malaysia. When I was on FaceTime with Val, I said, I haven't got the faintest idea what in the world's going on around here because I, I don't get any news. So I said, is anything worthwhile happening? She said, yeah, your neighboring country, Malaysia, a plane disappeared. I thought, I shouldn't have asked that question. But Thailand, 92% Buddhist and ancestral worship. 7% Muslim, 1%. So, all together, in 30 days, I preached 26 times, and I had the privilege of leading 109 people in the sinner's prayer, introducing them to Jesus. So, amen. That's my little report. I got my message, but... I think I've said all I'm supposed to say. And when the preacher has said all he feels he ought to say, then that's a good time for him to quit. Come on now. I've been in some meetings where I got through before the preacher ever got through. Ever happened to you? You know, he kept on waxing eloquently, but I'm, I'm over. I'm out. I'm done. So I'm done. I'm, I'm really, I'm really done. But I, I just want to thank you uh, for your prayers, uh, for your financial support, and uh, for being my wife's friend, and for being my friend. So we're going to close early this morning, but I want to thank you for coming to the house of the Lord. Don't forget Wednesday. Wednesday is Bible study. We'll see you in the house of the Lord. So could we just stand, please? Before I pray, the pastor in Chiang Mai, Thailand. He's married to a woman now that was born and raised in Thailand. He had gone to Thailand with Youth of the Mission. And so after he'd gone there, Youth of the Mission, he went back home to Canada, Prince George, Canada. 
25 years ago, he felt that God spoke to him and said, I want you to go back to Thailand. You talk about willingness and availability and obedience. Number one, this young man was not married. Number two, he did not know the language, the Thai language. And number three, he just had enough money to get himself a one-way ticket. And there was no typical of any support for him on a monthly basis when he got So he was willing, available, he was obedient. So 25 years ago, he jumped on a plane. He arrived in a country where at that time nobody spoke English. But he's got a wonderful church, about 150 people. Uh, the average age is about 23. And God has given him favor with college and university students. So God is getting his work done. And I want you to know, you may not have done it, just like the band dimension. But you have partnered with him. You have partnered with him. Because you have so seed in what they're doing. So whatever they're doing down there, you are part of it. And I want to thank you for your love gifts to this church from my behalf. That means you are partnering with me. And like my father. Let me find to say a number of things I said this morning. If that's what you want. And so we just shared what we feel we put on our hearts. And now, Lord, as we leave your house and as we go and have our lunch, Lord, fill us full of gratitude that we live in the United States and the Lord Jesus Christ that we have wonderful food to eat. So I thank you for these people that came today. Lord, as we leave this building, may your presence go with us in Jesus' wonderful name. And all of God's people say, amen. God bless you. Amen.